Good morning. I'm Ben Smith, and welcome to uh, First Baptist Church Bible Study again this morning. We are uh, beginning a, actually beginning a new quarter, a new month, uh, and we're, we're beginning this month, or this, this week, uh, with uh, Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. We have continued this story, uh, beginning with uh, uh, Joseph um, and, and his experience of getting into Egypt and bringing his family into Egypt after his uh, rise to power. Um, and now we're going to look at the, uh, remember that we, we were in, uh, there, they were, the, Egypt, the uh, Israelites were in Egypt for 430 years. Uh, and last week we looked at, <coughs> excuse me, we looked at uh, uh, Moses' uh, birth and his salvation from being uh, murdered by the Pharaoh, by all, like all male children of the Hebrews were to be. Uh, and we saw how that he was uh, he was saved out of that experience through through his parents and through his sister's diligence due diligence of of uh, putting him in the Nile in a basket being discovered by the Egyptian uh, king's daughter and her adopting him as her son and him uh, being raised as a uh, as an Egyptian uh, and then uh, uh, after that experience uh, <coughs> he was he had a, a, a experience where he was. Uh, involved in saving another Hebrew, killed an Egyptian, had to ev evacuate Egypt, uh, wound up being in, in the desert and, and becoming a shepherd for 40 years. Uh, he left Egypt at about 40. Uh, he then spent 40 years. And then we looked last week at his experience at the burning bush where God called him to go back to Egypt to bring the people out of Egypt and out of their slavery. So I want us to, uh, before we get involved in our lesson today, which is, <clears throat> which is a, about the Passover experience, I wanted us to look at some scripture. First of all, to look at a, a, a graph. Um, and I don't think you can read this. It's too small of, of, of writing. But I wanted you to see that what, what were the essence of what this is, is that there are 24 Egyptian gods that were defeated by the God of the Hebrews. Um, and I have marked them in red. I'm not sure you can see them. And um, uh, you can see that on one side, the plagues, there were, there were nine. There were actually ten plagues, nine of which have, will have already occurred before the day's lesson scripture. Um, the uh, blood, uh, Nile turning to blood, frogs, lice, flies, diseases with the cattle, the boils, hail, locusts, and darkness. Um, and these were 24 gods. Now, I know you can't, can't read this, and so... I'm going to include this in the email that goes out to anybody uh, on the list that gets, the, uh, gets this lesson. If you do not receive the email and you'd like to, uh, that has the notes on this, and we'll have this chart on there, if you will um, email uh, the First Baptist Church, uh, Tim Thompson at First Baptist Church, and just say to him um, you'd like to be on the list, and he'll get that information to us, and we'll, we'll get you on the list. Also, what I want you to see, too, also is that the tenth plague is, was a judgment on all the Egyptian gods. The first nine were all the gods, and then the tenth plague is going to also be. But it's also it's on a, a plague that affects Pharaoh himself for his taking the lives of the male children um, uh, of the Hebrews of which Moses was, was, uh, was saved. He was spared through the actions of his, of his parents. And so that's the scripture that we'll be looking at uh, this morning. Before we do that, I want us to look at chapter 11, all, all um, 10 verses of chapter 11, and I'm going to use the message uh, to, to give us a little summary and to lead up to our lesson today. God said to Moses, I'm going to hit Pharaoh in Egypt one final time, and then he'll let you go. When he releases you, that will be the end of Egypt for you. He won't be able to get rid of you fast enough. So here's what you do. Tell the people to ask each man from his neighbor and each woman from her neighbor for things made of silver and gold. God saw to it that the Egyptians liked the people. Also, Moses was greatly admired by the Egyptians, a respected public figure among both Pharaoh's servants and the people at large. Then Moses confronted Pharaoh. God's message at midnight, I will go through Egypt in every firstborn child in Egypt will die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne to the firstborn of the slave girl working at her hand mill 
Also, the firstborn of animals, widespread wailing, will erupt all over the country. Lament such as has never been and never will be again. But against the Israelites, man, woman, or animal, there won't be so much as a dog's bark. So that you'll know that God makes a clear distinction between Egypt and Israel. Then all these servants of yours will go to their knees, begging me to leave. Leave, you and all the people who follow you. And I will most certainly leave. Moses, seething with anger, left Pharaoh. God said to Moses, Pharaoh's not going to listen to a thing you say, so that the signs of my presence and work are going to multiply in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron had performed all these signs in Pharaoh's presence, but God turned Pharaoh more stubborn than ever. Yet again, he refused to release the Israelites from his land. So this is just a background for that, where you can see what's happening. Um, and so now let's move to chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Now, the Hebrews were very familiar with the concept of the sacrificial lamb. This was the question that Isaac, the son of Abraham, asked his father as they climbed up the mountain in order to go sacrifice Isaac. You remember the story. Abraham and Sarah were without children. Uh, God had promised them that they would have a child through Sarah. Uh, they got a little ahead of the game, um, had Sarah's handmaid uh, produce a child named Ishmael. And God said, no, Abraham, this is not the son of promise. You will have a son through Sarah. At 100, Moses, uh, Abraham had Isaac. Sarah was 90. Talk about a miraculous birth. Um, Sarah's birth of, of Isaac was at when she was 90 years old. And then, finally, Abraham had the only son that was a basis of his, of his own, from his own body, and on, on Sarah's own body. And then God said, Abraham, I want you to commit yourself to me to the point that you'd be willing to sacrifice Isaac. And I want you to travel to Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice Isaac. It was about three days' travel from where uh, Abraham lived to, to Mount Moriah. So he did, and for those three days in his mind, uh, Isaac was dead. Jesus was in the grave three days. And in Abraham's mind, Isaac was dead for three days. When they arrived at the bottom of the, of the mountain in the, or the area, uh, he left his traveling partners, and he and Isaac went on up on top of Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac and Isaac asked a very pertinent question at that point and Isaac said to his father Abraham my father and he said here am I my son he said behold the fire and the wood but where is the lamb for a burnt offering pretty relevant question don't you think they had all the elements of the sacrifice and Isaac makes the question, makes the observation, where is the lamb? How are we going to get, get the lamb? Abraham responds with a sense of faith. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. <clears throat> so God will provide the lamb. I'm not sure um, what Abraham was thinking. He knows that he is, he is going to commit to sacrificing his son. And so God has provided uh, that lamb for him. And so he, he proceeds up. What's interesting to note is, is that Mount Moriah is the present 
location of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was where Golgotha was, and Golgotha is where Jesus was sacrificed by his heavenly Father for the sins of all the world. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So God answered, answered Abraham, and answered him with providing a lamb. So the Hebrews are very, very familiar with this whole concept of a sacrificial lamb and the sacrifice of a lamb. And so um, uh, a- Abraham and Isaac were able to experience this provision of God of a lamb. Now, um, God through John the Baptist uh, brought us full circle to provide the answers that Jesus is the lamb, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of man and frees him from the slavery of sin. We see that um, when, Abra- when John the Baptist was baptizing, Jesus came to him to be baptized, and this is what, uh, what John says of him. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus is being identified by John as being the Lamb of God. He is being the, the Lamb that God's going to provide for the sacrifice in lieu of, of Isaac, in lieu of you and I. Um, <clears throat> Philip, um, a, a young uh, a layman, a deacon, um, it, he interprets for uh, the uh, Ethiopian eunuch on his way back to North Africa, he interprets Isaiah 53, 7 to talk about that. Now, here, here's, here's what the situation was. The eunuch was a man of, of means. He was the treasurer of the queen of Ethiopia, which is probably modern-day Sudan, uh, the northern part of, of, of north of, of Ethiopia. And he was a Jew in every respect in terms of his commitment to the Judaism and understanding who, who, that he wanted to be a Jewish, uh, that he wanted to be Jewish. He was a eunuch, so he could not be circumcised. So, but in every other respect, he was. And it was every male Jewish's, Jewish man, male desire to be in Jerusalem during the Passover at least once in his lifetime. Since he was a man of means, he was able to accomplish that. And wouldn't you know it, he happens to be there on the very time that Jesus is crucified and that Jesus is raised from the dead and that the church is initiated. And he is, he is overwhelmed with that. He's on the way back to North Africa and he's sitting in his chariot, riding along, and he's reading from Isaiah 53, 7. Philip, God picks Philip up out of a successful revival up in Samaria and puts him, puts him down in the middle of the desert to have tangency with this, this Ethiopian eunuch, and uh, there is a question that ensues. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb, before its shearer is silent, so he offers not his mouth. So Philip saw through the uh, interpretation. Philip, he sits down with this with the Ethiopian, and he sits down, and he, and he sh- starts with the beginning, and he shares with him the whole gospel message. The Ethiopian accepts Jesus as his Savior and Lord. He comes across the water, and he's baptized, and he takes the gospel back to Africa during the first century. What a marvelous experience of, 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 of God using this. And he uses this concept of Jesus being the lamb here in, in order to communicate to the Ethiopian eunuch. Well, Jesus, I mean, Paul makes the point that Jesus is the Passover lamb in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. No question here. Jesus is the Passover lamb, relating back to this experience in Egypt of the Passover. Then Jesus himself identifies himself as the lamb at the Last Supper, at the Lord's Supper. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, 
This is my body, which is given for you. So Jesus identifies himself, and he accepts that, that mantle of being the sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb that God is going to provide for the salvation of all mankind. God himself recognizes that when Jesus is about to be baptized and when he um, comes up uh, out of the baptism experience, God speaks and he says, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So, we've, we can see all through the New Testament how that Jesus is identified with this experience of Moses and the Hebrews in Egypt and the provision that God gave to them to redeem them out of 430 years of being in Egypt and taking them back into or offering them the opportunity to go back to the promised land that had been promised to, to Abraham. <clears throat> now I'd like for us to go back and look a little closer at verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now, um, this, this lamb that they're going to use as a sacrifice is going to be and needs to be and must be without blemish. Remember, they were to, to take it on the 10th of the month. They were to hold it to the 14th of the month. And now in chapter 11, we saw that. And that was to make sure that they had 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 plenty of time to make sure that the lamb that they had was unblemished. Now, that's significant because Jesus was unblemished and uncontaminated with the sin and therefore was capable of being the perpetuation for our sins or being able to substitute for our sins. In 1 Peter 2, 2, we find this. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And then... Um, John tells us in third chapter, verse 5, You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So that Jesus was, as Hebrew says, tempted like all of us, tempted like all of us, yet without sin. And we, we have that, that high priest that stands for us in that capacity. It was important that Jesus could be tempted, but not be sinful. Um, he couldn't stand for us at the point of execution because the wages of sin is death, unless he got to the point of execution. And so he had, God couldn't save us and mankind from heaven. So he had to come to earth and be subject to sin without sin in order to be the penalty for and substitute for our sin. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. Now, now we're introducing the concept of the blood. That's a, that's a very important concept, as we'll, as we'll see. Um, in Hebrews 9.22, Under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. We've talked about this before, but remember back in the garden when God, after the sin, God eliminated Adam and Eve from the garden. The first thing he did was he covered them with animal skins. He took away, they'd cover themselves with vegetation. Vegetation wouldn't last very long. But he covered them with animal skins. You know what had to happen to that animal in order for them to provide the skins? They had to die, and subsequently they had to bleed. And so right off in the chapter 3 of Genesis, in the beginning of, of God's story of mankind's redemption, he, he gives to us this Th long thin thread of blood and he shows how that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin and then in Matthew 26 28 um, Jesus as he's instituting the Lord's Supper the Last Supper as he's talking about that in relationship to the Passover he says this for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins so Jesus is identifying with this Passover experience. And not only, uh, he has already, and he's, he's taken this, 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 um, this Passover celebration that was celebrated all down through the, history, through, the, through the centuries, and he's saying, 
I'm going to add new meaning to it, and my blood is going to be for the forgiveness of sin. In Ephesians 1, 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. So that it was in Him, in Christ, that His blood that we are forgiven. In His birth, His life, His death, and His resurrection. That's a theme that we constantly uh, talk about as we in these in these lessons. Uh, that that's what Paul meant by being in Christ Jesus. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. So, um, to reflect the commitment of Jesus to the meal, it was not supposed to be a delightful meal. It was to be bitter. And that was re just reflecting the bitterness that Jesus had to endure uh, in order to suffer for us on the cross. The horrible experience that that was, and yet he did that. And so, this meal was to be uh, bitter herbs. It was to not be something that would be delightful, uh, not like a nice big steak, but, but bitter. Also, it was to be with unleavened bread. Now, there's two aspects of that. One is, all the way through Scripture, in almost every case, leaven is considered evil. And what God wanted to do is he wanted the Hebrews to get all the evilness out of their household, have unleavened bread, get the, get the leaven out of, you, out of their lives, and get, get ready for God to work in, in their lives. And secondly, they didn't have time to have the bread rise. And so... They had to use unleavened bread along with the bitter herbs for they were to be ready to go when God's angel uh, brought them out of Egypt. In verse 9, Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. It was probably not very practical that the Hebrews would have had a container that could have boiled an entire uh, lamb. So what would have had to happen is they would have had to break the bones of the legs and so forth in order con to conform that, that body into a, a, um, into a boiling pot. And God says, no, this lamb should be unblemished, as in God's lamb is going to be unblemished. And so um, to have boiled the lamb and to keep it whole would have required them to break it up. And so he wanted them to not have that happen. Um, Jesus was unblemished, and there was not a broken bone on his body. The legs of the two crucified with Jesus had their legs broken, but when they got to Jesus, he had already passed on, and so he's already dead, and so there were no broken bones with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. Again, there is the presence of the blood of Jesus being spilled for you and I. Now, it was just before uh, the crucifixion occurred, just before the, the celebration of the, uh, the Passover on Saturday the Sabbath, the Sabbath. And so they wanted to hasten the death so that they could get the men off the cross. So they broke their legs. Breaking their legs would cause them not to be able to raise themselves up and, and get air to their diaphragm. And that would, that would hasten the death through suffocation. But when they got to Jesus, he had already given his life for the salvation of all mankind. And so they pierced his side, but not a leg was broken, not a bone was broken in this unblemished lamb that God had provided for the sacrifice of all humanity. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. Now, I'm not sure they were supposed to even go to bed that night, but if they did, they had to go to bed with the boots on, with the sandals on, with a staff in their hand. They had to, um, they had to, they had to be ready to go and ready to, ready to move. God is about to move, and they needed to be ready because it wasn't going to take long for this action to occur in Egypt. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night 
and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Um, God's final judgment is about to be executed against Egypt. This is going to be, there's been ten plagues. Um, Pharaoh has on occasion agreed and then disagreed and then re, re, got, gone back on his word and not let the people, people go. But this is going to be the final action, and it's going, it's going to work. I will strike all the firstborn in the land. Now, notice that every firstborn in the land of Egypt, every firstborn in the land of Egypt is going to be struck, struck both man and beast. So the cattle, the, all the beasts, the, the pets, everything that was firstborn, and every man in Egypt is going to be struck. I will execute judgment, and he is saying, I am the Lord. There's that double time. He says, I will execute judgment. He's saying it again. Um, that, that means that like when Joseph interpreted the dream, the dream came two dreams. That means that God is definitely going to do it. There's that principle that we looked at uh, last week. Um, <clears throat> the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now, if every man in Egypt is going to be struck, firstborn is going to be struck down, then God gives us an alternative. He says, except where I see the blood, there's that blood again, I'll see it and know it is a sign that this is a Hebrew household who, has abide, who is abiding by me, who is trusting in Jehovah God, and who has therefore obeyed Moses' commands, which I have given to him. And they have taken the blood of the lamb, and they have spread it over the lintel and over the side post of the door of every home. And when I see that, God said, I will not take the firstborn of that household. Now what's interesting there is, is that it was the blood that was the sign. It was not the, the nationality. It was the blood that was the sign. Here's the logistics. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. Now, what I want us to see something here is very critical. Um, it's important to note that the criteria for the death angel to pass over the house was the blood on the door of the lintel. It had nothing to do with the nationality of the Hebrews. So what happened if a Hebrew just didn't take it, God didn't take Moses seriously that what God told him to tell him and decided not to participate, then the firstborn of that household would be taken. What happened if there was an Egyptian that potentially had come to know and understand that the God of the Hebrews was the true God and had accepted them and had become like them, had become a Jew and subsequently put the blood of the lamb of that sacrifice over their door lintel and over their doorpost? but they were Egyptian, then the death angel would have passed. In fact, the scripture says that the Hebrews came out of Egypt with a mixed multitude. So there were people other than just, just the Hebrews that came out with them. So, um, This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. As a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. So, not only here, here it was outlined for us, and then God brings to us the whole, the whole idea. He is forecasting Jesus, and he's saying, I want this beautiful word picture of the redemption of the Israelites out of Egypt that is a picture of what God is going to do in and through Jesus Christ through his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection for all of mankind. And so I want you to continue to do that. That, in fact, was the celebration that Jesus was celebrating with his disciple, 
He was celebrating the Passover. And he trans- transferred, translated the Passover into the Lord's Supper. And we, he gave it to us as an ordinance of our churches today. So that um, when they were to take some of the blood and to put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames. And so we, we review this and we look at this. And what, what God's really saying to us is this. It is the blood of Christ. We, that, impl- that brings us salvation. We must appropriate it. Having God is, in fact, that, uh, through Jesus, is the Savior of all mankind. But he's not all mankind's Savior. Those who have appropriated the blood of Christ and have placed in their hearts and had their hearts circumcised, as Paul talks about it, and have committed themselves to not only the saviorship of Jesus, but the lordship of Jesus as well. Therefore, having appropriated the blood on the door door, door lintel. That's what it takes. And that's what God has provided for us in the person of Jesus, who is who was who was born, tempted like as we are, yet without sin, who was who who lived and who died, and whom God was able to raise because he was sinless and he had not sinned, had been tempted but not sinned. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of this word, of your word. And Father, as we evaluate this Old Testament scripture in light of the New Testament, in light of what God has done for us in and through Jesus Christ, Father, I just pray that we'll, we'll understand and we'll be willing to appropriate the blood of Christ and the body of Christ and the sacrifice of Christ in our lives and accept him as Lord and accept him as our Savior. And Father, for those of us who are believers, I pray, Father, that you will heighten our sensitivity to those in our sphere of influence who are not. And would give us, through this scripture, through through understanding this scripture, would give us the insight of how to share with them like Philip shared with the eunuch. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.